Dash Core Group has filed a patent on this technology. It's done so for purely defensive protection of the technology and will freely license its innovations to the public. Now that this protection is in place, I'm excited to share what we've been working on. Good morning. Welcome to the DashPay First DAP presentation. I'm here with Chuck Williams and I'm Joshua Ziegler. I am uh, currently acting as UI UX tech lead for um, Dash core team. Uh, we have a number of core team members with us. Uh, I don't think we'll go through and introduce everybody. Um, Joshua and myself will probably do mo doing most of the talking, talking, excuse me. Um, this is actually the second time that we're going through this demo. Uh, we're recording this for public release. Um, and we are encouraging developers that are on the call to ask questions um, basically at any time. So we have Dash. Dash is more than just a regular cryptocurrency. It is a crypto that has privacy, usability, governance. And a while back, we started thinking about evolution. And we said, well, wouldn't it be great if Dash had usernames and merchants? That's pretty great. But there's a step that's better than that, uh, which is what we're aiming for with this uh, uh, evolution release. And that is user-created decentralized apps that are powered by Dash data contracts. So we'll get into what all the parts of that mean. Uh, so what is Evolution? Dash Evolution is a platform for building user-based decentralized applications, which we're calling dApps, on the Dash blockchain. What is a dApp? Uh, dApp is two pieces working together. Uh, it is an API contract that governs how users can interact with the Dash blockchain. And it's a client wrapper that can be embedded in any website, desktop, or mobile app. Dapps are data contracts. Uh, they're executed by third-party applications. They are not compute contracts on full nodes like Ethereum and Stratus. So this is a, a kind of a key distinction. Uh, with with uh, smart contracts, you're doing computation, and all that work happens in the network. But with dApps, the, the hard work of the calculations and computations happens in the client code, and then our network just confirms that it conforms with that API. So the short so this is the short answer to um, does Dash have smart contracts? Um, the smartness of your contracts uh, on the Evolution platform is expected to be written in your code of choice, and you will use the um, the DAPI, the decentralized API, to store the secure portions of the results of your computation from your smart contracts and store the results of those contracts on the Dash blockchain that's going to get hashed against the live data, kind of like how we're doing it in Sentinel already on mainnet? Uh, depending on the data that you store, yes. Uh, so what can you do with a dApp? Well, they make integrating Dash payments into third-party apps really easy. This is stuff like uh, details of a product a user purchased or a recurring subscription or moderated refunds. And there's a lot more applications that we haven't thought of yet also. Uh, so we do have a prototype that we've been working on. And I want to talk just a little bit about the architecture of this prototype, what you're about to see. Uh, this is a local website that's powered by evolution code. And by that, I mean that this little website doesn't know whether it's connected to uh, simulated data or real data. It's just running the same way it would in the, the real evolution release. Uh, the data for this site is stored to and read from the Dash Level 2 network, which uh, Chuck can talk a little bit about. Uh, I like your explanation for that better. Yeah, so um, the way I currently understand it, we have um, three layers that we are that we have identified for the evolution, Dash Evolution platform, uh, where layer one is basically the blockchain and the protocol and everything that happens at that layer. Layer two is this <clears throat> secondary layer that we're introducing that sits between layer two and three. Uh, where layer three is the end user applications and client applications um, that you'll run on your various devices. Layer two is that intermediary, the DAPI, um, Dash Drive, and uh, the parts that, that store and, and moderate that data, uh, and also the SDK. And that layer two, uh, we've got a simulation of it that's part of this prototype called VMN, which is Virtual Masternode. And that's a browser-based development environment that simulates all the stuff in layer two and uh, layer one, and that way you can build and test apps without having to have testnet running or anything like that. You can just do your local testing, and you can take a look at the status of the Dash Drive 
primitives and really see what kind of changes you're having on the blockchain. Uh, this local website is going to connect to DAPI through a simple API that is created by the DAP developer. So this is a demo of the, the Dash Pay DAP. And uh, the simple API there is just to do things like retrieve contract tax and uh, uh, connect with other users and things like that. One question for Chuck before we move on. Hmm. The You described the three tiers. This is a new different three tiers that you're talking about different than how we think about our network now as two tiers. Can you, that might cause some confusion. Can you just speak directly to that just for the clarity? Right. Yeah. So the, um, I think if you're referring to the two tier network being the, um, the mining network and the master node network as the two tiers. Um, yeah. So what we're doing is we're basically leveraging that second tier to create that second layer so it, it's still that that master node network still is that second tier or second layer that enables that third layer of end user applications so this is more of a an evolution of that on chain concept where we've got one and two tiers and now we're adding that ability for the third tier essentially yep so and that'll be you'd maybe think of it pre 12.3 as being the two tier system and then post evolution or into 13 as being that that three tier that you talk about. Right. I think the understanding is clear. Uh, some sometimes it takes people a, a, a little while to understand and, and shift uh, into this paradigm. But once they understand the shift, I think it's understood why we're going this direction. Generally, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's just important you use the right terms because maybe tier isn't even the best like you almost need to have a term to separate them out just for yeah they're for very much more lack of confusion right yeah We're, i think layers is a good choice right now yeah, layer um, over tier maybe yeah so there's yeah, they are there. logical layers of of clear segregations of of development type and now it's time to launch the demo so as joshua launches this demo um i just want to reiterate what we're demonstrating here is um, I guess what I'm affectionately calling a full stack mock prototype. Um, we are mocking as much or as as full a stack as we can um, and making uh, the code um, we're designing the code around uh, the functionality that we need for the front end and trying to work that back through the back end with the team the back end team rallying to support these efforts by servicing the DAPI and uh, dash schemas so that they provide this basic functionality and complete this thing that I call threading the needle, which is going all the way from the front of the tech stack to the back of the tech stack to confirm um, that our beliefs are true from a development perspective. All right, so we've launched the demo and I wanna emphasize that the point of this demo isn't to show what evolution is going to look like uh, or even to, uh, to produce something that we're going to, to use to, to make evolution. The point of this is to, to force us to build out all the stuff that evolution needs. So this demo has users. You can log, you can go in as a user, you can create a new user, all this functionality. The point of it is to help us tease out what the API needed to look like, what the libraries needed to look like, and, and to, to give us a chance to build those things and see what they would look like. This is Chuck's threading the needle thing. So here is the context list app. Uh, this data is all coming off the blockchain and we're going to log in as Alice and Alice does not currently have any contacts. So let's fix that. Alice is going to add as a contact, Bob. And now Bob shows up here under her proposed contacts but he hasn't responded back yet. So let's log out of Alice and let's go over to Bob and see what he sees. Bob didn't used to have any friends, but he's just gotten a contact request from Alice and he can confirm that. And now we've written this to the virtual blockchain. Alice and Bob are each other's contacts. Bob can go in and look at Alice's profile and, uh, he can even look at a payment address for her. Now this is a stand-in 
Uh, but this is generated from a public HD key that Alice gave Bob. So he can make one-time payments to her over and over again. Uh, and those public, public key addresses that he's paying to are specific to him. And Alice will be able to tell that his payments came from him. Uh, we're going to build functionality for paying and request payments so that you won't have to deal with the addresses. So that's the basic functionality of the demo. We can log in as somebody else. All right, so I want to show you what's happening here on the blockchain. So when we load the app up for the first time, it mines all these new users onto the onto the blockchain. And here in local storage, you can see that the VMN has core, which is just a copy of a block of the, the blockchain. You see the first block here. It's got all the stuff you expect to see on a block. And then also it has dash drive with its index of contracts, which right now it just has the one contract, which is the dash pay dap contract. And remember I talked about the, uh, uh, the API, the data API, that's this dap schema. This lists off the format that the network will accept for our library to, to store. Also we have user states. So here's our user Alice. Right now Alice only has one object in her user space, which is just where she says that she wants to be part of the dash pay dap. So we can log in as Alice. And if we add a contact for Bob, you can see in the, in the console here that we've mined a new block with this transaction transition. And if we go into Alice's user space now, she has a second object, which is her contact with Bob right now. Uh, it's on revision zero. And if we go over to Bob's account and we verify this contact, he'll have a, a an entry for her as well. So right now, Bob does not have, he only has just the one. Uh, he sees this because Alice has put this out there for him, but his user space isn't affected at all until he takes action and confirms the account, the connection. And then we can see Bob's user space now has two objects. Alice's user space hasn't changed. Uh, she's still on revision zero for her contact with Bob because when he confirmed it, he's just putting something in his user space. He's saying, I am giving Alice my public HD key. So uh, whenever you make a change with confirming or denying somebody or, or sending a payment or requesting a payment, it doesn't affect their user space. It's all changes that you're making to your user space that they can see. <coughs> Seeing that part uh, is really, really powerful for for the skeptics of what we've been working on. Yeah. Are you able to show the via that as part of your demo? Because I think it's a really powerful thing to see the very simplified user interface and then to be taken in and showing that it's actually happening on chain. Like there, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that. going on there. That that's what the shows, yeah. There's there's an even better visualization of this, which is these two images of the block explorer that we're working on. Uh, so here is here's a mock-up of the block explorer. Uh, and this shows the different wow, this is... DAP user objects. So here's Alice's space here. 
when she first signed up to use the DAP, that's her first call, this first column here, it's the first object in her user space. And it's a, a user object where she just signs up to use DAP. And then she makes contact with Bob and that's its own transition. And then she makes contact with one other person and that's its own transition. Over here in Bob's space, he's just signed up for the DAP, and so has Charlie. These blocks are being mined right now, though. How is that? A, or you're just making blocks when you need to? Yeah. Would these contacts and stuff be propagating through blocks traditionally like they would normally? I.e. there's like a, lay, a block leg to getting a contact? I, I can answer that. So the, the objects are on layer two. So everybody someone has a contact, a uh, contract, every blockchain user gets a space in that contract. What you're actually doing is that you're batching changes to the state of your data within that contract. That batch um, gets hashed in a Merkle tree and the hash gets stored in a special transaction we call a state transition. And that is what goes in the block. So this is layer one, layer two. So layer one of the blockchain is the blocks obviously it's very expensive it's fully verified it's fully replicated um so we store the minimum minimal amount of data on layer one inside the block which is the hash of the changes and that is kind of stamped by a quorum um then on layer two is the actual data and that's where you you build up changes to the state of your the state of your data in a contract um over time and layer two data in Dash Drive has a different kind of profile, different economics behind it. Um, it doesn't have to be fully replicated. Um, block verification doesn't depend on the full data. Uh, the, con the consensus is, uh, it's an emergent, con uh, emergent consensus. Um, so it's a different profile. So basically the bulk of the data is stored on layer two, which is a lot cheaper, but you use layer one to prove that data. It's kind of, you know, annotating it onto, onto the blockchain. So it's, it's like a really efficient way to, 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 to store a lot of data. Sure. Similar to how we started with Sentinel. It's yeah, it's kind of right. Cause Sentinel we're not storing the entire object and everything, right? Yeah. So we took the Sentinel data off out of blocks and we built, it's actually technically it's a data cube. It's kind of, a, a it, it's still a chain. Every change to the state of your data is chained. It, it is chained. Um, and we store the hashes of those changes in blocks. It's a cube chain. It's a cube chain. Sick. Yeah, I don't think people realize that we're not just rebuilding like a better Bitcoin, but we're rebuilding like a foundationally better way to have an architected like cryptocurrency network. Like, yeah, this, this is, is Ethereum and Bitcoin and everything all put together. Don't smile, Chuck. It's totally true, man. This is like this is this is why you need to share this stuff. This is why this is so important to get out there. Yeah, this yeah you're is getting it. Beyond what everybody thinks it is, it doesn't matter what it looks like, like on the front end. Um, this is this is evolutionary. Yeah, it really is. Wow, it opens up a lot of opportunities, especially for it's... you know merchant developers of the world. Like they'll be able to do anything that they want. I mean, as long as they're able to figure out the logic on their end, um, they don't have to worry about securing their data. Basically, they can use the Dash network to secure sensitive uh information that would normally need to be in the form of a honeypot in some database somewhere and it'll be computationally secured by the blocks of our network keeping right them. yeah wow and your and your dapps private key and you know there could be other mechanisms that you build in using the sdk absolutely that's slow clap from canada all right, so that is that's the demo. Uh, as for uh, a lot of this stuff that we were just talking about, is not going to be able to be in it, and uh, soon we'll have the block explorer to to demonstrate this stuff in, with this technical stuff with a lot more polish. Uh, so here is a, a little more technical detail. We talked about how a DAP is two parts: it's the contract code and the client code. The contract code here you saw earlier it's JSON schema and it defines the format of the data that we are okay with storing. And then the client code does the storing and retrieving and, and calculation on that. 
uh, and inside our network, we have the DAP data that stores user states and transitions and objects. So third-party apps interacting with our network are only going to run this client code and uh, and our dash our uh, dash pay SDK library. And somebody that needs to create an integration with Dash just has to write these two bits, just the contract code and the client code. And the client code could be quite simple and, and be functional. And just to clarify the stuff on the left, even though it's named dash.org, it's because it's Dash's DAP that's testing, right? Not inter just to clarify that, because that's, you know, you see it on the left side there, but that could be like, anybody's schema that wrote a DAP, right? It's not That's right. it's from dash.org. It could be amazon.com slash or something. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, yeah. That's the intent. Exactly right. And what if someone hacks the schema or I guess it's just referencing this, this file on this link? When you register a DAP, you, as I understand it, also register the schema and those become uh, cryptographically secured as a registration on the blockchain, very much like a user. Uh, the other thing that's a really big deal about the DAP development with this sort of structure is that because the clients are only attaching to our DAP SDK, we're able to change whether the DAP SDK connects to this VMN, whether it connects to testnet, or whether it connects to mainnet, and as far as the clients are concerned, that's all completely invisible. So this makes testing a dream. Yeah, I was going to talk about that too. From a front end developer's perspective, like this is this is really really nice. Having this out of the gate is going to accelerate development. I think for all developers. Well, yeah, you guys can actually build stuff without like thirteen computers and miners <laughs> and, and all the steps, right? You just get to run some code. Yeah, yeah, it reduces the the cost for entry. Yeah, that's great. This is fantastic to see. Yeah, we intend to build a DAP generator also, sort of similar to the proposal generator, to to really help people get kind of kickstarted. All right, so this is just a quick summary of what we showed. Uh, this is the the contacts list apps features. So we logged into a local website using an existing Dash blockchain user. You can also create a new user. Uh, we found and connected to a contact that also existed on the blockchain. These two contacts privately exchanged HD extensible pub public keys so that they could make unlimited one-time use payment addresses. And all of this data was verified against the blockchain with the full security of, of Dash kind of doing that. So I just wanted to say like this, this closes the loop. This confirms um, our belief that we can indeed make first-class citizens out of usernames and leverage them for the benefit of, of many, many different kinds of uh, features from a protocol perspective that will enable a lot of functionality um, and, and ease of use, uh, both for, for end users and merchant developers who we're targeting for this, this first evolution launch. Yeah, we're pretty excited to make more demos too to show other ways that we can use this system. And I'm currently collecting prototype ideas. If anybody wants to send me things, I will try to collect and, and prioritize those among a number of ideas. It'd be cool to see them without Dash's name on them, so it's clear that they're like coming from the third, like a third party. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I have a business owner who um, has offered his designs um, for us to use uh, from a public perspective um, where we can just implement um, what he's thinking of, of doing on the Evolution platform. Uh, here's some contact information. If you'd like to reach out with thoughts or ideas, uh, we also have uh, email. I'm Joshua at dash.org, and we're both on uh, Dash Nation chat. Yeah, so send us any questions, comments, thoughts, um, and uh, thanks for your time.